Hi, everyone. Today we have another co-author spotlight of the book, How Healers Heal. We have Dr. Mithika Hanavar. Hi, Dr. Mithika. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Hi, Dr. Pradhan. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, it's just a wonderful journey to see this book actually come together and uh, just just waiting for the publication so that we can reach out to more people. So a little bit about myself. I am a physician. Uh, I'm board certified in family medicine, addiction medicine, and now lifestyle medicine. I practice out in Southern California and uh, I do mainly addiction medicine work, and I also do lifestyle medicine consults, and it has just been a fabulous journey. Thank you for that introduction. So what introduced you to lifestyle medicine? So interesting. Um, I got a flyer in the mail from like the Harvard Lifestyle Medicine course. And I'm like, okay, I need to try this out because there was this gap that I was feeling in my understanding of lifestyle and eating disorders and, you know, the whole conundrum about obesity. And I thought maybe this might be worthwhile. And I was also working on my project on screen addiction at that time. We were doing some community trials with really good results for cutting down our screen time. So I wanted to add like a lifestyle twist to it. So that's how I got to the uh, to the conference. And then uh, I guess, as we say, rest is history, right? And one thing led to another, went ahead and took the boards. And this was all in 2020 when everything is in lockdown. So it was easily accessible remotely. Um, and other than that, Dr. Lavenda who many know uh, does this life unity program so i had gone and attended one of the classes from his program and was very inspired to uh, work with it as well excellent so it was like a, just a happenstance mailing lucky for lifestyle medicine that we have you now because of that mailing so I know you've incorporated it into your practice and you're heavily into addiction medicine. Uh, tell us a little bit more about how you use lifestyle medicine in your practice. So uh, um, so it's a, it's a little bit, uh, you know, there are two parts to it. One is I do lifestyle medicine as a part of our um, Southern California Lifestyle Medicine Program with Dr. Lavenda and Dr. Karanam. Uh, so we see patients in the consult service that's apart from the weekly classes that they attend. So it's like a physician outreach for the patients and which is going very well. We have a lot of need for access. So it is that that's generally a good meter, like, okay, it is well-received program. The second and more uh, intricate part of doing this work is through addiction medicine. Um, so to give you a little background, so uh, being a family doc, we have some training in mental health, but as part of my fellowship, I was working on the floors for Stanford psychiatry. Um, so one year that I did my addiction medicine fellowship, we also had to work with eating disorders because people who are in recovery may also develop eating disorders, especially women. And that's kind of how I got into like understanding our relationship with food a little bit more. And that's always been on my radar. So once I started working in addiction medicine full time, uh, I also did maybe a, a, a year, over a year in eating disorder clinic. And I understood, again, a little bit more closely how, to, how do we treat patients with eating disorders. But then, hey, wait. So we have all of these approaches for people who have eating disorders. But there is this whole population within the U.S. that had disordered eating, not really meeting criteria for eating disorders, which is great. Now, what do we do for that? And that's kind of where uh, my addiction skills, my lifestyle skills, and my eating disorder skills all come together. So for patients who are in early recovery, maybe a few months sober, um, we have the talk, do you want to do lifestyle medicine? They go to the same program but the thing is they have more physician contacts or they come back to me in my clinic and we work on both their recovery and their lifestyle together. I love that. So it's a, obviously a truly whole person approach rather than treating one part of whatever they need. I'm sure a lot of us have fit into that category. I know I do of like stress eating and it takes a lot of mindfulness to not stress eat. Um, I'm, 
you probably work with stress eating a lot that doesn't fit into the eating disorder. Do you want to talk about a tip for stress eaters like myself? Uh, yes, of course. So stress eating. Yes, I also will identify it. Right? Uh, you know, give me um, anything sweet. Uh, you know, you'll have me right there. Like I could totally stress eat it, right? Um, so a couple of tips. First is generally nobody sets out that day thinking I'm going to have stress eating at 10 in the night, right? So part of it is like eating disorder work. What would you do? You would plan your day, plan your meals better, have, you know, when the sun is shining brightest, that's when you have the biggest meal. Most of us want to like not eat all day long, and then in the evening, the body goes into this shock mode, like, oh my goodness, I'm starving. And that's when the stress eating occurs. So if you are able to time your body with the time of nature, uh, kind of like a more uh, Eastern practice, that works best and meal planning. And oh, it's, I know it's so boring to do meal planning, but plan your meals and, and including the treats you are going to have. And in that moment, you, you know, eat with all your senses. That's a great tip. I, I like to munch on dates when I'm stress eating, but I limit myself to two. <laughs> I don't know if that helps anybody. Um, okay, well, let's shift gears a little bit to the book, um, and then we're going to get back to your field a little bit. What do you think about our book, How Healers Heal? Why should doctors read it? Why should patients read it? So I took a sneak peek at other people's uh essays and I'm like oh I wish I had written that so a lot of amazing content is out there and I think the first thing that happens with working in healthcare you know we are we are the worst right we do not pay attention to our own bodies we we do the best uh, that we can to help people who are their most vulnerable times especially those who work in the hospital environment and in that our own uh, it, it is a function of the job, right? You have to keep your own like uh, biology aside, just going completely in the zone and help the person who needs you, your help right now. So, but then how do you then look at the other side, you know, physicians who have high burnout, who have high mental health issues, who have high, uh, you know, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, all of that also creeps in because this is how we get through the day. So, you have 33 stories from people who have taken a step back in their free time and figured out a way to make it work. So I think that's the best thing. That's why, you know, the title, How Healers Heal, because when healers finally pay attention to themselves, they have to like really go down to the nitty gritty because otherwise we will rationalize not doing good care for ourselves. Like, oh, that's okay. I will take two tablets tomorrow. It's okay. Right. So those of us who are like finally decided we've got to do something about this, it's it's a lot to learn. And um, why should everybody be able to read this? So first of all, it will help physicians and other healthcare professionals, right? Um, kind of understand the conundrums we go through and um, find find some part, some story that will appeal to them. Right? Not everybody's story is going to be the same. And maybe one or two stories that reach out to you that will help you heal. Um, for, um, for in general, for, for non-medical professionals, it's, it's always, we, we exist in this zone where either we are perceived as those people who are really good or really bad or somewhere in between, uh, but nobody thinks of us as, okay, we all, all have the same struggle. So it's a, it's a good way to understand that, hey, they are also having these struggles. And also we are known to not take care of our health. So it's a fun, like, oh, really? I was always, you know, so many of our patients do so much better than us, right? For to uh, take care of their health. So it would be very entertaining for them to read <laughs> I think. I agree with you. And that's one nice thing about lifestyle medicine is it tells the doctors to walk the walk, right? We have to apply all these principles to our own lives. And, and these stories are so compelling, like you said, about our own uh, struggles. And I want to credit you for coming up with the title of our book, because that was your title that we all voted on. So thank you for the title, which is an amazing title. 
uh, and definitely encompasses the message that we're all trying to share. Um, switching back to your practice of lifestyle medicine daily, what is the number one takeaway you could tell someone struggling with um, why well, let's focus on your field of addiction medicine uh, and what number one takeaway could they apply today without reading the book just from watching uh, watching your and learning from you today number one takeaway for lifestyle ah for me oh my goodness my number one thing that i do for my lifestyle is actually gardening <laughs> it's probably not even mentioned in the book but it really helps me to be outdoors, connect with the soil, play with the soil, you know, work, see things grow and not grow, right? You know, the, the reason that uh, most gardeners know, right? We plant like, you know, 10 plants and, you know, five of them die, but we still look good because the other five have survived and we'll take nice pictures and post them. <laughs> so it's all it's always like this, almost like a variable ratio, right? Almost like gambling. We don't know how many of them are going to make it. And it's kind of soothing to just, you know, hear the birds, you know, uh, be in nature, see the bees. Uh, that, that would be my number one. And that no, may not apply to everybody. So something that can apply to everyone is sleep. Like get get as much sleep as you can. Um, and there's no like, oh, I'll sleep tomorrow. It doesn't happen, especially the older we get, right? The sleep becomes elusive. So when you put the lifestyle principles together, when you eat during the daytime better than in the evening, when you take a walk after dinner, and when you plan to sleep, you have to make a plan for it. Otherwise, you're not going to get that sleep. So when you plan to be in bed at 9.30 or 10, however boring it sounds, uh, that's when the next day you're going to be refreshed and uh, good to go. I feel like sleep is like the billion dollar problem. You crack it, you crack the code. I agree with you. And we've heard that from a lot of other co-authors. So thank you for that. Is there anything else you want to share with our viewers other than go read Dr. Mythica's amazing chapter and get a copy of your book, but anything else you want to share or add and I will, of course, have your um, Twitter and Instagram links uh, available for our readers. So I actually have a question for people watching this. It's like, are there need, is there a need to have options available for decreasing our screen time use? And if so, please do let me know. That's an interesting question. Why, why do you think there's not a need? I you know, in my opinion, of course, right? I'm an addiction doctor. I will think there's a need for everything, <laughs> anything related to addiction. I'm very passionate. Uh, at the same time, people do use it to self-soothe that up to some extent, and they become very possessive about that. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure other people want to have, need to cut down their screen time, but my screen time is just a-okay. Like, don't tell me to do so, <laughs> right? So reflect upon it. Like, whether it's for yourself or your family or... I don't know, people you see out in out and about in the world, uh, is there a need to build solutions to connect more with our lifestyle or to be less on our screens? And if so, where do you see the need? Well, that's a great question. I hope the readers respond. Um, I'll respond from an ophthalmologist standpoint. We see a lot of dry eye disease with screen time and even in young patients and uh, my bony and gland dysfunction because of lack of blinking. So without getting ah. the mechanism of it, um, it is definitely a cause of dry eye disease. Um, so, and then you mentioned connection with other people. I do see that when we go out to restaurants, sometimes people are on their screens and they're not actually connected and even just kids, um, you know, if, yes, it does bring peace to the restaurant, but it's okay to let them go some controlled crazy or learn how to sit properly in a restaurant without a screen. I, I, I do think there's a need, but I'm obviously I'm one of billions of people. Let's, let's hear from what the readers have to say. Um, anything else you want to mention? Uh, read the book. <laughs> absolutely read dr mythica's amazing chapter and all of the other co-authors thank you so much for joining us dr mythica and i will see you soon see you bye-bye thank you